Hello everyone and welcome back to another reaction video. Today we are taking a look at Napoleon's retreat from Russia. And without further ado, let's get going. Peace lies in Moscow. Oh, if only it did. If only it did. Russia, 1812. Napoleon invades his former ally with the largest army Europe has ever seen. But for the French Emperor, the decisive blow remains frustratingly beyond reach. Russia's resilience is unlike anything he's ever encountered. And as winter closes in, his army begins the most infamous retreat in history. The 15th of September, 1812. 83 days after invading Russia, a week after his costly victory at Borodino. 83 days, that's about almost three months and you remember that Napoleon's original plan called for five weeks of campaigning. So he's well, well beyond his uh, set time or planned time to be in Russia. So yeah, things are not obviously going as planned. <laughs> no. Napoleon entered Moscow. He expected to be greeted by dignitaries formally offering the city's surrender. Instead, he discovered that 90% of Moscow's inhabitants had fled. A fire had started the previous night and was blamed on drunken soldiers. But over the next 48 hours, fires continued to break out across Moscow until most of the city was ablaze. Count Fyodor Rostopchin, the city's governor, had ordered that Moscow be destroyed rather than allowed to fall into enemy hands. Yes, here we see the continuation of the Scorched Earth strategy, going so far as to burn down Moscow rather than let it fall into Napoleon's hands. And I believe uh, Leo Tolstoy in his War and Peace uh, dedicates a few chapters to this, uh, talking about how agonizing a decision it was for um, Count Rostopchin for, to make this decision. And there was much liberation about whether they would actually go through with this. And uh, it's very understandable, as we pointed out before, Moscow is the historical heart of Russia. And, you know, you don't make such a decision lightly, I would imagine. But yeah, Napoleon will not find shelter in Moscow, thanks to this action. Now, fires were being started deliberately by Russian criminals, freed from jail and acting on police orders. French soldiers rounded up and shot any they could catch. But the inferno was impossible to contain. In four days, two-thirds of Moscow was destroyed. With the fires finally under control. Well, luckily for us uh, who appreciates historical buildings, the uh, Kremlin did survive the fire and Napoleon set up headquarters there actually. Um, but yeah, much of the rest of the city was gone basically. Napoleon's soldiers turned their attention to systematically looting the ruined city. While from his new quarters in the Kremlin, Napoleon sent a letter to Emperor Alexander in St. Petersburg, inviting him to make peace and end the war. He received no reply. Yeah, Alexander I was, at this stage, not interested in any sort of negotiated settlement. Uh, he had made his mind up by this point that he was going to take Paris and end Napoleon's domination of Europe forever. And uh, Napoleon will wait far too long for a reply from the, the Emperor of Russia, which will never come. Napoleon waited, confident that Alexander would eventually negotiate. But as the days passed, he grew increasingly uneasy. 
And, you know, looking at it from Napoleon's perspective, it's not that strange to think that he could expect peace negotiations. Uh, because in previous campaigns he had seized uh, Vienna, and whenever he seized Vienna, for example, uh, the Austrians always had no option to but to surrender, basically, which uh, is understandable. Uh, if you capture the capital, you win the game. That's probably what went through his mind. And Moscow was, for all intents and purposes, a capital of Russia. Even if it wasn't the capital, which was St. Petersburg at this time. But still, um, yeah. Napoleon would not get any messages for a negotiated settlement. Cossack raids were disrupting his vital communications with Paris, as well as the arrival of supplies. While the steady attrition of French forces and Russian reinforcements meant Napoleon was outnumbered for the first time in the campaign. Rumors also reached him that his reluctant allies, Prussia, and Austria were in secret talks with his enemies. Yes, Napoleon's situation at this point is extremely precarious. You are trapped far behind, or trapped or trapped, uh, sort of trapped at least, behind enemy lines. You have trouble getting supplies this far up, uh, far into Russia, and your communication lines are being harassed. And then you have two potential great powers switching sides in the middle of this conflict and stabbing him in the back while all his armies are in Russia. Because, you know, they know how many troops Napoleon has already lost in this campaign. They are have not been sitting idly by and, you know, not keeping an eye on the situation. And they are starting to sense an opportunity here to get out of their forced alliance with France and uh, reclaim their lost territories. Napoleon had proposed that the army winter in Moscow, but that now looked too dangerous. Reluctantly, he accepted that the army would have to move back to Smolensk to find safe winter quarters. Napoleon knew how severe Russian winters could be, but continued to put off his departure reassured by fine October weather. And we've talked also about this in previous um, reactions that Napoleon had studied past campaigns into Russia and he knew very well how the situation was in Russia, that it was going to be hard to supply his troops there and that the Russian winter was a dangerous threat to any army. Of course, Napoleon still badly underestimated uh, much about Russia, most of all their political, geopolitical response to the invasion. And as it turns out, it will be an extremely costly mistake. And by this point, it's already a very costly mistake, but it's gonna get worse. And hoping that at the last minute there might be a message from Alexander offering peace. It never came. On the 13th of October, the first light snow fell. Five days later, Kutuzov launched a surprise attack on Murad's advance guard at Vinkova and defeated it. Napoleon, stung into action, gave the order for the army to leave Moscow the next day. Our video sponsor, the old hull-down sniper. Thank you to World of Tanks for supporting this video. Now is the moment my campaign begins. Emperor Alexander of Russia. Yes, Alexander correctly realized that this was the moment to strike back. When he, when Napoleon had stretched his uh, supply and communications uh, lines as far as they could go. And they've been at the breaking point ever since uh, Napoleon marched on from Smolensk. And many people 
including his chief of staff Berthier and Marshal Murat, among many others, tried to persuade Napoleon to stop at Smolensk. But alas, Napoleon just had to go to Moscow. He did not follow his plan. thousand men of the Grande Armée left Moscow in a column 10 miles long, with an estimated 40,000 carriages and carts. There were women and children too, army wives and the vivandières, the women who cooked for the soldiers. Yeah, I think we forget this when we are talking about these wars, and any wars in the pre-industrial age, really, is that most armies at this time were accompanied by a large number of camp followers, civilians basically, uh, wives of soldiers and even children. And why, well, you could ask, why would you bring your wife and children with you on campaign? Well, there could be many reasons of this, of course, but often, of course, it was the man who provided for the household and uh, they couldn't, you know, survive back home. Uh, they had no income or no way to bring in uh, food and put food on the table. And so the only option was to accompany their men on campaign and, you know, support them that way. And uh, there were also many civilian clerks, uh, professional bureaucrats, basically, that helped uh, Marshal Berthier maintain this huge apparatus that was the Grand Armée. So there were plenty of civilians of all different kinds with the army, and that just added to the uh, supply, exasperated the supply situation. As well as some civilians. Every wagon and pack was stuffed with as much food and loot as possible. As he set off, Sergeant Bourgogne of the Imperial Guard made an inventory of his pack. It contained several pounds of sugar, some rice, some biscuit, half a bottle of liqueur, a woman's Chinese silk dress embroidered in gold and silver, several gold and silver ornaments, amongst them a piece of the cross of Ivan the Great. Besides these, I had my uniform, a woman's large riding cloak, two silver pictures in relief, 12 inches long and eight high, all in the finest workmanship. Also several lockets and a Russian prince's spittoon set with precious stones. I wore over my shirt a yellow silk waistcoat, which I had made myself out of a woman's skirt. Over that, a large cape lined with ermine and a large pouch hung at my side by a silver cord. This was full of various things, amongst them a crucifix in gold and silver and a little Chinese porcelain vase. Then there were my firearms, powder flask and 60 cartridges in the box. That's quite an impressive array of loot, I must say. And, uh, you know, didn't soldiers get paid, you may ask? Yes, they were paid. Uh, Napoleon had helped to reorganize uh, the Grand Armée when he became the leader of France. And, yes, there were pay, but the pay was not that great, to be honest. If you were a member of the Imperial Guard, say, the pay was, of course, much better. But otherwise, to bring in some real cash, you had to uh, partake in looting to, uh, you know, get paid, really get paid. And uh, this sergeant uh, clearly succeeded in that task. Now, the problem is, can he make it back home to France to be able to enjoy his loot? Well, that's a different question entirely. This heavily encumbered army did not yet realize it was in a race against time. The Russians were beginning to move against the flanks of Napoleon's 550 mile deep salient. That very day, Wittgenstein's army was driving back Marshal Saint Cyr's outnumbered force at Polatsk and drawing Victor's 9th Corps west to support them. In the south, Admiral Chichagov's advance had Schwarzenberg's Austrian corps falling back to cover Warsaw. The corridor was closing. And then there was the weather. <laughs> 
though Napoleon was confident his army could reach winter quarters in Smolensk in 20 days, well before the more extreme temperatures were due to hit. Napoleon planned to withdraw via Kaluga, through unspoilt country where the army could forage for supplies. But Kutuzov sent General Dokturov's 6th Corps to block the road at Malayaroslavets. In fierce fighting, Italian troops of Eugène's 4th Corps drove the Russians out of the town. It was a hard-won victory, reminiscent of the fighting at Borodino. Kutuzov now stood between Napoleon and Kaluga. Yeah. Withdrawing via Kaluga was a good idea by Napoleon, and it was basically the... And like they said, it was unspoiled country, it hadn't been stripped bare of supplies, and southern Russia was more... Um, more agriculturally rich, so it would be easier to get more supplies to feed the army. But of course, Kutuzov is uh, not stupid, and he knows this and correctly moved to block his path at Maloyaroslavets and then circle ahead to block the road entirely. Napoleon now took the unusual step of conferring with his marshals. And after discussing various options, he decided that rather than seek another major battle, they would retreat the way they'd come, along the Smolensk road. And they said this was a very unusual step. It was extremely unusual for Napoleon to seek the advice of anyone. Usually Napoleon made his decisions and they were final and he made them quickly and decisively. But this was uh, an extremely precarious situation and it really shows by the fact that he called a conference of the marshals to discuss the situation. And uh, yeah. They decided to withdraw from where they had come, rather than seek another major battle. Because at this point, the French army does not have any reserves, and they are outnumbered. So, if the battle would turn against them, there would be nothing to call in. Like there was at Borodino. At Borodino there was at least the, a contingent of the Imperial Guard, ready to be thrown into action. This time there's no such thing, and it's just simply too risky. Napoleon had hoped to avoid this route, as it meant marching back through country already stripped bare of supplies. The day after the fighting at Malayaroslavets, Napoleon was nearly captured by a group of Cossacks, and saved only by General Rapp's charge at the head of his escort. General Rapp, and I've said this before, General Rapp is Napoleon's faithful aide-de-camp. He saved Napoleon so many times throughout his reign, it's quite ridiculous. And, uh, yeah, good thing Napoleon had a personal bodyguard, the Chasseurs à Cheval, to protect him. Otherwise, this could have ended pretty badly. After this close shave, Napoleon had a file of poison made up which he carried around his neck in case of capture. Those who were too weak to carry their weapons or knapsacks threw them away and all looked like a crowd of gypsies. Private Jacob Walter, 7th Württemberg Regiment. Yeah, the situation will deteriorate quite rapidly at this point. Napoleon's army set off on its new course, shadowed at a respectful distance by Kutuzov's army to the south. They passed the old battlefield of Borodino, a grisly, unnerving Yikes. sight where crows pecked at half buried corpses. Just imagine that, just walking past that. All these half buried corpses and the stench and the real sight, ugh, yeah, that, that's gotta be terrible, 
relentless marching quickly began to tire out men and horses. A few days later, the temperature fell below freezing. The army's overworked, starving horses died en masse. Discipline began to break down, as some drivers simply dumped the sick and wounded by the roadside to try to ensure their own survival. Yep. From uh, here on out, it's every man for himself. And uh, that just goes to show you, if people are desperate enough, they will do anything. Even kill their own fellow soldiers and comrades by dumping them on the side of the road uh, to survive. As the French column became increasingly strung out, General Miloradovic, commanding Kutuzov's advance guard, fell on Davout's rear guard outside the Asm. Yeah, uh, General uh, Miloradovic is uh, one of the more famous and more competent Russian generals that fought in the, during the Napoleonic Wars. Sometimes he's been called the Russian Mura. And uh, if I recall correctly, he was also uh, a bitter enemy of General Bagration. But uh, <laughs> that's besides the point. And uh, yeah, Miloradovic would go on as the governor of St. Petersburg after the war. And he was killed during the December's revolt. But I digress. For a few hours, Davout's first corps was cut off until Eugène and Ney came to his rescue. The battle ended with street fighting in Vyazma as the French hastily evacuated the burning town. For the soldiers of the Grande Armée, so unaccustomed to retreats and routs, Vyazma was an alarming, demoralizing blow. I can imagine. The road was stretched, strewed with the dead, our suffering succeeded imagination. General Rapp. On the 4th of November, it began to snow heavily. The next night, temperatures plummeted to minus 20 degrees centigrade. Ugh. That's cold, man. Few men or women had proper winter clothing. You know, here in Sweden, we occasionally get winters like that, minus 20 degrees Celsius. And uh, yeah, it's not pleasant at all to be out during that weather. And uh, that's when you're fully equipped with winter clothing and all that. And these soldiers, these poor soldiers, only had summer uniforms. I... So yeah, how would they survive it without shelter? And the answer is unfortunately that they didn't. Or access to shelter. Many froze to death overnight. The next morning, wagons and guns were abandoned. Many soldiers sought to save themselves, ignoring officers, stealing horses and food, and leaving the column to scour the countryside for supplies. Many of these foragers were found by the Cossacks. Some cut down or lanced, others robbed of every possession and left to freeze. In a few cases, they were handed over to peasants, eager for retribution against the foreign invaders who had plundered all they owned. As the army struggled on towards Smolensk through blizzards, Napoleon ordered Eugène's Fourth Corps to strike out for Vitebsk, where there were large French supply depots. But Vitebsk had already fallen to the Russians. Yeah, here we can see the problem emerging here. The French had these huge supply depots all over Russian territory. However, there's simply not enough troops at this stage to defend all of these, uh, all of these garrisons or all of these uh, supply depots. We have Sixth Corps, Second Corps, and Ninth Corps. They're all busy. Uh, fending off uh, General Wittgenstein. And so there's nobody left to uh, adequately guard Vitebsk. And, uh, you know, we will see this repeat itself. Fourth Corps was too weak to fight its way through and rejoined the army, minus its artillery and most of its baggage. A colonel who saw Fourth Corps at this stage described men without shoes, almost without clothes, exhausted and famished, 
sitting on their packs, sleeping on their knees, and only rousing themselves out of this stupor to grill slices of horse meat or melt bits of ice. Just three weeks after leaving Moscow, a third of the army was dead or captured. About half the rest formed a growing army of stragglers, men without units, prepared to fight only to survive. Napoleon reached Smolensk on the 9th of November. The first troops into town ransacked the supply depots, leaving nothing for those who followed, including Ney's rearguard, which arrived six days later. Napoleon had hoped to make Smolensk his winter base, but the state of the army and lack of supplies meant the retreat had to continue. But the five days he spent there gave Kutuzov... And this is why he shouldn't have stayed at Moscow. If he had retreated earlier, then there's still the possibility he could have made safe winter quarters at Smolensk. But at this point, it's just too late. The, the supply situation is so terrible and... Uh, the general state of the army is just completely in disarray. So there's no possibility of him staying at Smolensk. Soft time to circle ahead and prepare an ambush. When the French retreat resumed, he struck 30 miles west of Smolensk at Krasny. And this is, uh, during the retreat is where we see Kutuzov at his best, really. He is constantly harassing Napoleon's army. He is circling ahead, laying ambushes, blocking roads. He's really making this extremely difficult for Napoleon. And he should have credit for that. In three days of desperate fighting through knee-deep snow, Napoleon used his Imperial Guard to hold open the road, as Eugène and Davout's corps fought their way through the ambush with heavy losses. Two regiments of the Young Guard were ordered to make a sacrificial counterattack to keep the Russians at bay, and were virtually annihilated. Here we see that Napoleon is finally using his uh, Imperial Guard. And if Napoleon is using his guard, the situation is very desperate indeed. Because we're, as we've noticed and as I've discussed previously, Napoleon does not like to put his guard into combat. He cared deeply about it and didn't want to see it destroyed. But at this point, he has no other options. He needs to use every man he's got. And uh, the young guard here was uh, probably the unit of the guard that saw the most action during the Napoleonic Wars. And the young guard was, of course, the best conscripts of each year's intake. And uh, these were pretty good, pretty good young soldiers, but they were sacrificed because there was no other option at this point. Kutuzov held back many of his troops and was blamed for not trying to destroy Napoleon's army when he had the chance. It's possible he was concerned at the number of raw conscripts in his own army, also suffering terribly in the freezing conditions. Yeah, we like to talk about how General Winter is... Uh, terrible to all the Russian invaders, and that's true, but General Winter does not discriminate. General Winter is very bad for Russian troops themselves, even though they might have a better equipment for the winter uh, to survive the winter cold, it's still freezing cold, and uh, yeah, they're also suffering. So I think we should cut Kutuso some slack here. All the Cossacks and the Russians in the world shall not prevent me from rejoining the army, Marshal Ney. Yeah, legendary Marshal Ney, this is where he makes his name. Not every French corps broke through at Krasny. Marshal Ney and his 6,000 strong rearguard arrived on the 18th of November to find the road blocked by 60,000 Russian troops and no sign of the promised support from Davout's first corps. Ney's men hurled themselves against the Russian lines with desperate courage, but were mown down. Rejecting several invitations to surrender, Ney led the survivors in a daring night crossing of the Dnipro River 
Then across 45 miles of open country, under constant attack from Platov's Cossacks, to reach Orsha. By the time Ney rejoined the army, his rear guard was down to just 800 fighting men, leading a column of several thousand stragglers. The army regarded his escape as a miracle, and when Napoleon heard of it, he immediately dubbed Marshal Ney the bravest of the brave. A title he rightfully deserves. This is beginning to be very serious. Napoleon to General Kolanko. Yeah, beginning is uh, one word to describe it, I suppose. Napoleon had escaped one trap, but now three Russian armies were closing in from different directions and outnumbered him nearly three to one. From the east, Kutuzov's main army with 65,000 men. From the north, Wittgenstein with 30,000 steadily driving back Marshal Victor's Ninth Corps. And from the south, Admiral Chichagov's army of Moldavia with 34,000, having detached General Osten Zakhen with 30,000 to prevent Schwarzenberg's Austrians and Renier's Saxon Corps marching to Napoleon's aid. Napoleon was heading for Minsk, a major French supply base with vast stores of the food, clothing, shoes and ammunition that his army so desperately needed. But on the 21st of November, disastrous news arrived. Minsk had fallen to Chichikov. There we go again. He then marched on Borisov, driven out the Polish garrison, and captured its bridge over the Berzina River. By rights, the Berezina ought to have frozen solid by now, so Napoleon could have crossed anywhere. But a sudden thaw had turned the river into a torrent of ice and freezing water. Napoleon was at least joined by the hard-fighting Marshal Udino and his second corps, which hadn't suffered as badly as the main column on its retreat from Polatsk. Udino launched an immediate counter-attack on Borisov and retook the town, but couldn't stop the Russians burning the bridge. With no other bridge for miles in either direction, it seemed Napoleon's exhausted army was finally doomed. But there was one sliver of hope. Polish cavalry had found a ford across the river, near the village of Studienka. Napoleon issued a flurry of orders. Second Corps was to fake preparations for a river crossing south of Borisov. Victor's Ninth Corps, arriving from the north, was to form a rear guard east of Studienka to hold the Russians at bay, while engineers worked as quickly as possible to build pontoon bridges across the river and win Napoleon's army a fighting chance of escape. Yeah, the Battle of the Berezina River should have been the end of Napoleon. But this man um, showed him from his best side here. This is Napoleon at his best when he is confronted with a terrible situation. His back is up against the wall. He finds that genius again and de delivers um, a flurry of orders. He makes the decision decisively, quickly, and this is how Napoleon is able to escape this uh, trap, you could call it at this point, that the, or encirclement rather, that the Russians have set up. Our situation is unparalleled. If Napoleon extricates himself today, he must have the devil in him. Marshal Ney to General Rapp. Yeah, that's a fair statement. <laughs> On the afternoon of the 25th of November, General Eblay's Dutch engineers began building two 300-foot pontoon bridges across the Berezina River. They worked day and night, sometimes chest deep in freezing water, and completed both bridges in less than 24 hours. Few of the engineers survived the ordeal. Yeah, military engineers, no matter the era, 
even today, are really the unsung heroes uh, of any army, basically. And Napoleon's engineers worked miracles throughout his many campaigns, and they were an integral part in ensuring he would escape here at the Berezina, but they were also a major um, part of all of his campaigns, you contributing much to his success. So, shout out to military engineers, basically. Chichagov had been totally fooled by the diversion south of Borisov and was moving his troops south to face it, allowing Napoleon's army to begin crossing its rickety bridges virtually unopposed. Udino's second corps led the way to secure a bridgehead, followed the next day by the remnants of the main army. Priority was given to formed troops, still able to fight. For the time being, the army's vast crowd of stragglers remained on the far bank. By the time Chichagov realized his mistake and began moving north, Napoleon had troops in place to defend the crossing. On the east bank, General Partonneur's 12th Division, 4,000 relatively fresh troops from Victor's 9th Corps, formed the rear guard. As Platov's Cossacks approached from the east, the vanguard of Kutuzov's main army, Partonneur tried to rejoin 9th Corps. But caught in a swirling blizzard, with visibility down to 50 meters, he marched straight into Wittgenstein's army. 50 meters is not a whole lot, and there's no way you'll be able to spot an entire army with 50 meters of visibility. His entire division was killed or captured. The next morning, Chichagov and Wittgenstein launched coordinated attacks on both sides of the river. There was desperate fighting on the West Bank, where Marshal Udino was, yet again, seriously wounded. But his Swiss infantry held the line, until General Dumerck's cuirassiers, the army's last heavy cavalry, charged and routed the Russians. At great cost, Polish and German troops of Victor's rearguard held off the Russians until dark, then pulled back across the bridges. For two nights, officers had been trying to get the vast camp of stragglers to cross the bridges when they weren't being used. But with temperatures reaching minus 30 centigrade, minus they preferred to stay put, huddled around their yeah, fires. Yeah, I totally get that. That they would uh, stay huddled around their fires, because... Minus 30 degrees with no shelter or adequate clothing. It's a death sentence, I'm sorry to say. At dawn on the 29th, with the army leaving and the Russians approaching, thousands of stragglers surged in panic towards the bridges. Dozens were crushed underfoot. Others fell or were pushed into the water or tried to swim, which was certain death. Yeah, even if you made it across the river, hypothermia would kill you pretty soon afterwards. When French engineers burned the bridges at 9am, thousands were cut off and left to the mercy of the advancing Cossacks. Some became prisoners. Others were simply put out of their misery. What appalling misery. What a multitude have perished in this retreat. Captain Franz Böder. Since the retreat began 43 days earlier, the Grande Armée had marched nearly 500 miles under constant attack, starved, exhausted, and for the last 23 days in lethal sub-zero temperatures without proper clothing or shelter. You gotta say, that's an impressive distance to cover in a month or so. Um, but yeah, it came at a very, very high price. In that time, the fighting strength of the Grande Armée had been reduced from around 124,000 men 
to 20,000, with as many stragglers still following the army. As the retreat continued to Vilna, the weather turned even worse, the temperatures falling to minus 37 degrees Unbelievable. Centigrade. Minus 37. The Russian armies at least now held back, leaving the winter, the Cossacks and Russian peasants to finish off the invaders. On the 5th of December, Napoleon left the army, traveling incognito across Europe at breakneck speed and reaching Paris in just 13 days. Naturally, English satirists capitalized on Napoleon, seeming to abandon his defeated army. And many soldiers did regard it as an act of betrayal. But his generals supported his decision to leave. There'd already been one attempted coup against Napoleon in Paris, and there was much work to be done to rebuild the army and reassure France's allies. Yeah, and I also am on the side of the generals here. Napoleon had shepherded the Grand Armée out of the worst of it, and at that point he could leave it in someone else's hands because he didn't really have time to stick around. He really needed to get back to Paris, start raising fresh troops because he knew this disaster would cause Prussia and Austria to waver. And the situation in Spain isn't that great either at this point. So, uh, yeah, Napoleon needs to get back and contain the fallout. And, you know, it's just got to be done, uh, even if some soldiers did regard it as a betrayal. And I understand that, too. On the 9th of December, 51 days after the retreat began, around 20,000 ragged survivors of the Grande Armée began crossing the Nyman River back into friendly Polish territory. According to legend, Marshal Ney was the last man across. That's something Marshal Ney would do, though. Second and Third Corps are no more than a memory. The latter numbers only 16 men. Marshal Ney to Berthier. So, yeah, that, that, that's unbelievable, really. Uh, because a corps, in normal cases, was somewhere between 15 and 30,000 men strong. And for the Russian invasion, these corps were over strength and could be between 50 and 70,000 men. So, the fact that Third Corps only has 60 men left. It's crazy to think about. Napoleon's invasion of Russia had proved to be one of the greatest military disasters in history. He had made fatal miscalculations about geography, logistics, and above all, Russia's political and strategic response to his invasion. These blunders cost his empire around half a million men, as well as a quarter of a million horses and a thousand cannon. So, yeah, I would say out of all of these losses, the loss of trained horses and horsemen was the biggest loss from the Russian campaign. Because that is an issue that will haunt Napoleon in the 1813 campaign in Germany and even in the 1814 campaign where he basically had no cavalry to speak of. So yeah, that is the biggest loss, but of course many veteran soldiers and generals were also lost during the campaign and it was just all around a disaster. No way about it. But another way. No two ways about it. For every 12 men who marched into Russia with the Grande Armée, one was killed in action or died of wounds. Two were taken prisoner, one of whom died in captivity. Seven died from disease or the effects of climate. Just two returned alive. 
contrary to myth, many more soldiers had died in the summer advance from heat, typhus and dysentery than were lost in the winter retreat. Common myth. Russian military casualties were estimated at 150,000 and a huge but unknown number of civilian deaths. The Russian campaign was a catastrophe for Napoleon. Oh yes. Not just in lost troops and resources, but in damage to prestige and reputation. That winter, all his enemies sensed weakness and prepared to join forces against him. But the Emperor wasn't going down without a fight. Back in Paris, he admitted to his ministers, Fortune has dazzled me, gentlemen. I've let it lead me astray. Instead of following my plan, I went to Moscow. I thought I'd make peace there. I stayed too long. I've made a grave mistake, but I'll have the means to repair it. Hey, at least he recognized the errors he had made. That's not something all men would do in his position. All right, that was the retreat from Moscow. And uh, yeah, thanks you for joining and I'll see you guys next time.